All right, so uh, welcome, welcome to the CPP uh, seminar. Uh, I think this is the first time of online uh, uh, seminar. So uh, I'm happy to introduce uh, today's speaker, Emmanuel Florin. Uh, he received his uh, PhD in 2014 uh, from the I call the North Wales you know, I'm not sure, but this is one of, one of, one of the select, yeah, yeah, thank you. Selective, uh, the graduate school, uh, uh, graduate school in, in France. And then his PhD is based on the microwave uh, quantum optics. And then he spent three years at the world uh, at the, uh, UC Berkeley uh, as a postdoc uh, at a quantum uh, uh, nanoelectric laboratory. And at the time, uh, the PI was uh, the orphan CKB. Uh, we are familiar with him. We have connection with him, right? So, and then he moved to uh, laboratory classes in Boston so he's a, as, as a, a junior researcher chair. And then now he's the permanent researcher at the, the CEA Sakurai. Uh, this is this is a, a nuclear research center so located in Paris, and then he is currently working on single photon detection and then, and then qubit uh, architectures, right? So the recently he, he uh, published a very interesting paper to PRX uh, describing uh, on, on very innovative uh, scheme to detect the single photon. And then today, uh, this is a special uh, seminar uh, to hear uh, from him uh, what is it about. And then we are looking for the collaboration with him and then the possible application to our action search business. Okay, let's, let's welcome him. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so thank you for the invitation. Uh, that's actually my first uh, on virtual, uh, virtual seminar, so uh, I'm very glad to experience uh, this. So, um, so yeah, today I'm going to talk about like um, uh, detection, efficient detection of uh, single microwave photons. And uh, so to, we, we do that by, uh, by engineering uh, like um, an irreversible coupling between a qubit and, and an incoming photon. All right, so, so that's, uh, I will uh, describe like the, this in the first part, part of my talk. In, and in the second part of my talk, uh, I, I will just present my, our latest uh, results about like uh, detecting uh, uh, spins um, that are emitting photons uh, using this uh, microwave photon detector. And I, I believe it's uh, of interest for you because it, uh, yeah, I believe that it's, it's a task that is actually quite similar to the action search task, right? I, I mean, in terms of like uh, resources. Um, so let's start uh, very, um, uh, at a very uh, basic level of uh, microwave quantum uh, optics. So can you see my mouse, uh, by the way? Or, um, actually, uh, I cannot. Not really, but it's okay. Yeah, but you know, I, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to have it. Okay. Okay. Let, let me just try to to have my. To be like quite. Uh, okay. Okay. Let's try to do without the mouse. Uh, we'll see. Um, yeah. So uh, uh, quantum optics uh, uh, at microwave frequency. So. So a quantum light can be described as a by a, a wave function. Okay. Let's let's call it a psi, right? And uh, this wave function um, will, uh, will behave uh, either as a wave uh, or as a particle, uh, depending on, uh, on the, the way uh, the, the instrument you are going to use uh, to, to probe it. So like the choice of observable uh, will exhibit is wave-like behavior or is particle-like behavior, okay? So like two large class of, uh, of detectors, available uh, uh, at microwave, in the microwave domain or in the optical domain. On one side, uh, we have like the linear amplifiers. So, um, so in the microwave domain, these are like uh, uh, LC circuits uh, with uh, uh, squids, right? And, uh, and also a photon detector. And so linear amplifiers are going to detect like a, a quadrature uh, of, the, of, the, of the quantum light, okay? And so the, observe, the, uh, the uh, result associated with this quadrature are going to give like an amplitude and a phase, so a, a complex number, okay? And so this complex number is actually associated with the wave-like 
uh, character uh, of this, of this uh, light. So now you can choose another type of detector, which are photon, det photon detectors. So these are ubiquitous in nature, right? Like our eyes uh, are like a, a good photon detector. And, and photon detectors uh, are most, you know, like will reveal the particle-like character. And so the, the result that we, uh, we expect from a photon detector is a, is a number. So it's a whole number, okay? So let, let, let's review uh, very briefly like uh, some very basic uh, uh, quantum state of light. So we can start with the, the simplest one, which is the quantum vacuum. So let's say the field, uh, the electromagnetic field is in its ground state. And, and let's review briefly uh, what, what uh, we expect uh, uh, as a measurement for this uh, uh, vacuum state. So uh, if you are measuring it uh, with a linear, ampli linear amplifier, since the linear amplifier is measuring the quadrature, so A plus A dagger, and this quadrature uh, is not, uh, the, the vacuum state is not an eigenstate uh, of this quadrature uh, observable. So you expect, uh, according to the Heisenberg uh, principle, that like to, to observe like va vacuum fluctuations. So you, you, you will observe like a complex number, but which is like uh, uh, randomly fluctuating, okay? On the other side, if you, if you use a photon detector, so the, the observable you are, you, you are like uh, picking is like A dagger A, so the number operator. And so in this case, like the vacuum state is an eigenstate of the, uh, of the photon of, of the number operator. So uh, you can, you are allowed to, uh, to, to perform a measurement uh, without noise. So like the ideal measurement would be just the absence of click of the detector. Okay, and this is absolutely noiseless in the ideal case, of course. So, so and you see like, uh, so in this very uh, simple case, like the, the difference uh, uh, of, of, of the observable is actually like a quite a dramatic, give a quite dramatic change uh, on the nature of the, of the noise you will observe. So let's review another state, like the uh, single uh, quantum excitation. So the Fox state one. So, it, if you, are, uh, if you have a linear amplifier, you, ex you expect uh, um, an excess of fluctuation because there is no phase, uh, phases associated uh, with, uh, with the Fox state one. So you, you, just you should observe just the rise of, of uh, qu quantum fluctuations. However, on the photon detector side, uh, you, you, in the ideal case, of course, you, you should observe like a click at each time uh, this uh, single Fox state. Uh, is uh, eating your detector. And so once again, so on one, one case, you have like an excess fluctuation, on the, on the other case, you have like a noiseless signal, right? Something which is a, just give one at each time. So this is like, um, so uh, we can clearly see that like photon detection is, is actually quite superior for detecting this, this kind of, uh, of, um, of signal. So what are linear amplifiers good at then? And so, there is a whole class. I mean, like uh, this Hilbert space is uh, is huge, right? And so, like one example, for instance, where like linear amplifiers are like extremely useful is if you have like a current superposition between the vacuum state and the single uh, uh, and, and the one Fox state, right? And so this current superposition exhibits a relative phase exponential i phi. And so now, if you try to measure this with a linear amplifier, what what is going to happen is like the the phase, the relative phase, is going to be uh, to be very uh, 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 to be exhibited as like a, the phase in, in an oscillation, right? And so linear amplifiers are well suited to measure this uh, kind of relative phases between uh, uh, between uh, quantum states. On the other side, like photon detector, you will just observe like a noisy uh, sequence of clicks, right? And there is no way, I mean, like uh, uh, in, in this simple setup, to, to reveal the, the relative phase between zero and one. Okay, so this, uh, this detector is not very well suited for this kind of task. Okay, so this uh, j is just to give you like a, a hint of, of um, you know, like what are the pros and cons of uh, each uh, detection type. Um, so uh, let's review very quickly how uh, optical photon detector works. So they are basically working on, on the same principle. So you have your quantum state of light psi and you have some material uh, like so here represented in blue. And so when the photon hits uh, the material, uh, you can have like a, uh, you can have like what is called like a photoionization. So if the energy of the in incoming wave packet is larger than uh, the ionization energy of the material, then you will just like uh, uh, separate a, a charge. 
and create a hole. And so now if you place uh, this material in, in, within electrodes, um, uh, then the, the displacement of this charge is going to create some currents. And, and by measuring this current, so you, you will be able to detect a click of the detector. So the presence of, of, a, of a photon. Okay, and so this is a very, um, a very general, general um, a mechanism, right? So it can be either done with like semiconductors, but also with superconductors. So this is a, with superconductors, this is where you have like the best, uh, um, uh, the best detection efficiency and dark counts, but also bio, biomolecules are like, uh, in a sense, working uh, uh, this way. Okay. So, so this, 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 uh, this is nice, but uh, there is a big caveat because this principle is extremely hard to implement in the microwave, uh, in the microwave domain. And the reason is because, um, so here I'm plotting the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and so micro microwave photons are like five order of magnitude uh, smaller in energy uh, uh, compared to uh, optical photons. So you see like on the far left, you have like the super high energy uh, radiations. On the far right, so the low energy radiation. Optical domain is something some, somewhere in the middle. And, um, and microwaves like sits like five order of magnitude below. And so like a, a nice comparison uh, I, I like to give is to compare th this spectrum to like the realm of uh, birds. So for instance, so if, if you compare like for instance, the kinetic energy of a bird uh, with like the, 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 the energy of each of these photons. So like uh, of optical photon would just like be a, like an ostrich, right? Like hundreds of kilograms so, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and running pretty fast. Like, uh, and on the other side, like um, um, a microwave photon would be m more like a hummingbird, like so like weighing only a, a one gram or two, right? And so you see like, uh, this gives like a, a good sense of what is five orders of magnitude. And so infrared uh, photon would be like a goose or something like that. And so the, the, the immediate uh, consequence, right? Is that like a, a micro, a mean bird or microwave photon are like extremely ineffective at, at triggering like a large um, microscopic or uh, microscopic phenomenon, right? Whereas like a goose, like uh, for chase, chasing like uh, someone is, uh, is way more effective or like an ostrich is even more, okay? So that, that's, uh, that's uh, an analogy, right? So, and so what happened is like, it doesn't exist uh, uh, any material uh, that have like a, a ionization energy or a gap energy uh, which is uh, sufficiently small uh, to allow for like uh, uh, efficient photon, photon detection, right? So people have tried uh, to use graphene. So, so graphene have, can exhibit like very small gaps, but even with graphene, uh, uh, like the resolution you can, you can get is, is not enough to, to uh, reach a single photon sensitivity. Okay, so this is to say that like we need to change strategy uh, in, order to, in order to perform this, uh, uh, this detection of micro photons. And so this uh, strategy is going to move to uh, what is called like circuit quantum electrodynamics. So basically we are going to, to build like a small quantum processor uh, in order to process uh, the information coming from the, this incoming wave packet. So basically we, you know, we, we kind of like, um, um, so like the, the, the strategy you used before which the Hammer strategy, right? And now we are moving to like a more subtle one where we basically we treat like the incoming incoming photon as like a, some, some piece of information. Okay, and we will try to, to treat it as gentle as possible. Um, and so the busy, uh, building block of this uh, circuit quantum electrodynamics is a LC oscillator. So the LC oscillator is, is an oscillator uh, where, where you have like an inductor in, uh, in parallel with the capacitor. And so the energy is, uh, is actually oscillating between a, an inductive energy where you have like some, uh, some flux threading the inductor and a capacitive energy where you have some charges uh, at, at, the, at the plate of the capacitor. And so like here I, I wrote the Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian is just like the Hamiltonian of an harmonic oscillator. And what is quite fantastic, I mean, quite, um, quite neat is that like uh, flux, the magnetic flux and the electric charge are actually like a, a conjugated quantities and conjugated in the sense of, uh, uh, of quantum mechanics. So they are as conjugated, conjugated than uh, position and momentum, right? So the, the commutator gives exactly a, a, a high H bar. Okay, and there you can see that it's extremely straightforward to treat this as like an, uh, an harmonic oscillator, right? So you just have to think of the flux as a position and the charge as a momentum, okay? 
So we have like a nice harmonic oscillator. And if your LC oscillator is superconducting, uh, this harmonic oscillator can, can live for, uh, for a while. So now we need like an extra ingredient in order to, um, uh, to, to bring some uh, interesting feature uh, in this uh, QED, right? And so the, the key feature is the Josephson junction. So the Josephson junction is actually the, the only dissipationless uh, uh, nonlinear element uh, in, in the microwave domain. And so it is composed of like uh, uh, two superconducting leads that, that are separated by a thin, very thin insula insulator bar barrier. So the, the barrier is like a, a few nanometer wide. Okay, and the tunneling of Cooper pairs from one side, uh, from one lead to, to another is actually like a highly nonlinear. And so, so on the, on the right, uh, I've displayed like picture of like a, a Josephson junction uh, in our circuits. So here we are like suspending them like to improve the quality factor um, uh, and everything. And you see that that's really like the, uh, like a, a microscopic element. So it's, uh, it's uh, on the nanometer scale. Okay, and, but for the, for the following, we'll treat this uh, Josephson junction as a nonlinear inductor. Okay, and so now, uh, instead of uh, uh, having like a LC oscillator formed with like an inductor and a capacitor, we have like a Joseph, Josephson junction, which is like this nonlinear inductor and, and a capacitor. And what you see is that like the potential uh, rather than being harmonic now is like, a, is like more like a cosine, uh, cosine, cosine uh, like a cosine, okay? And so uh, this, uh, this brings some anharmonicity to our harmonic oscillator. And now you see that like the spacing between the, the levels of this harmonic oscillator are, are becoming like um, um, non-equally spaced. So you have like a slight uh, uh, lift of degeneracy between the spacing, be between th these levels. And actually this is enough to, uh, to, to make a, a qubit, all right? So now if you can address uh, the, the, the first transition uh, differently from the second transition, then, then you're good. You have your qubit and you can define like the bottom, uh, bottom state as like the ground state and the first, uh, the first state above as like the excited state and, and you, we have the qubit. And so in practice, uh, this, uh, this circuit is simply like the circuit uh, represented on the, on the top right. So it's just like two pieces of, of uh, superconductor so big piece like millimeter sc uh, scale uh, that are uh, connected uh, with this like uh, microscopic element, which is the Josephson junction. And this is a, what we call like a transmont qubit. And this will play the role of our artificial atom uh, for the rest of the talk, okay? And so like now the, the task of like detecting a photon uh, uh, will be, how can we map the uh, incoming wave packet into uh, the state of art, of our artificial atom. Okay, so that's, go that's gonna be the, 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 the aim of the goal, uh, of, the, uh, of the game. And so like, yeah, something very important. So, okay, so here I, I, um, uh, we have like the ground state and the excited state and something extremely important is that like we have like ways uh, to measure uh, extremely accurately uh, if the qubit state is in its ground state or first excited state, right? So on the bottom left, on the bottom right, here are represent like the, a single shot readout of uh, such a, such a qubit. So it's um, so I, I, I won't talk more about it, but like it's a phase space of a, of an oscillator, right? And you can see that you have like two distinct blobs that correspond to the state uh, uh, zero or the state one, like the ground state or excited state of the qubit. And so this means that like if we manage to map the single photon onto the state of this artificial atom, then we are good, right? It means that like we will be able to detect it very efficiently. Okay, so let's um, let's let's review a, a pretty naive way to perform this task of mapping the incoming photon on, on the on the on the qubit, right? So one way we, we could do that is by using the Jens coming Hamiltonian. So it's just like a, a like co coherent exchange of energy between the incoming photon. Uh, between a cavity and, and a qubit, right? So the, the Hamiltonian is described here. And if the photon is on resonance of the, with the qubit, you can see that like when the coming, uh, when, when the, the photon enters the cavity, right? It will be able to excite uh, the state of the qubit, okay? But like th there is like a, a drawback to, 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 this, uh, to this is that like, uh, Due to the, the, the other term, so you have two terms in the, in the jet coming Hamiltonian, you have like the ab absorption term and the emission term, right? And due to the, 
yes, it must be like a reversible and, and emission, right? As soon as you as, as you get excited, you will you you will uh, de-excite like right away, okay? And this is a problem because this leaves absolutely no time for for like reading out the state of, of the qubit, okay? So we would like to perform this task. So that would be the simplest implementation, but uh, but this this doesn't work very well because uh, it, 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 we need somehow to to make make this uh, this uh, uh, excitation stuck in, in the qubit. So what we want to do in the end is to make this interaction irreversible, right? So we want to suppress the the right term, okay, which is uh, the term that corresponds to the emission of a photon by, by the qubit, okay? So so that that's gonna be the the goal. I mean, like the, the high level of, uh, of working of our of photon detector. Okay, so how to do that? Because you, you, you know, like the, the Hamiltonian, uh, uh, you know, like in quantum dynamics, you are not allowed to have like a non-emission Hamiltonian. So that's a, a, bit, uh, a bit sad, but like actually there, there is a way around. Okay, so we all know the Schrodinger equation. So here I, I, I um, display the Schrodinger equation in the formalism of density matrices. Uh, you know, that, that are like well suited for open systems, uh, but like it's a, believe me, it's like a, the, the classic Schrodinger equation. But actually, so in this open system formalism of uh, density matrices, you have, you have like uh, second terms that are usually used to describe like uh, decoherence and, uh, and uh, you know, like the, basically the lack of quantumness of systems, so which is a, a dissipative term, so the Limbladian. And, and this formalism has been uh, described like uh, later in the history of, uh, of quantum mechanics. Okay, and so like what is neat is that like this uh, uh, operator L, they, they look like a lot Hamiltonians, except that they are allowed to not be Hermitian, right? So uh, this L operator can, can uh, are cross maps and, and, they, and they, can, they describe like a, a irreversible evolution. And so rather than engineering uh, an Hamiltonian, which is a, a reversible, we, we are going to engineer a, a Limbladian, so this L operator which is basically the, the equivalent of an Hamiltonian, but uh, in, uh, which are irreversible. Um, so, so here's a, a small sketch. So here's the, the L operator, so the jump operator we are going to, to try to, uh, to engineer is the, the, the Hamiltonian I've presented before, but without the, the, uh, without the emission term. So the, the, uh, the, the L operator is A sigma dagger. So if you have an incoming photon, so A, so yeah, sorry. So A is um, the operator, operator associated with the cavity, so with the field, electromagnetic field in the cavity, and sigma is the operator associated uh, with the excitation of, of a qubit. So this uh, A sigma dagger operator will just describe uh, will just describe like the excitation of the qubit, but um, um, in a dissipative way, right? And so what we are going to do to to uh, to make this uh, this magic uh, happening. We are, we are going to engineer a bath in order to, uh, to, to, to make this, uh, uh, this process uh, uh, dissipative, right? And so uh, if, if you manage to have this, right, now you have like a plenty of time to measure the state of your qubit because the qubit cannot, uh, cannot be excited anymore uh, in, in the line. Okay. So how does it work? So uh, this um, uh, bath engineering, so this is, uh, the, this is how it's called, um, is actually relying on a four-wave mixing. So four-wave mixing is uh, ubiquitous in, a, in, a, in quantum optics, right? So that the fact that if you have like a nonlinear uh, element, uh, then you are allowed to mix uh, four waves, right? So four waves of your choice, okay? And here our nonlinear element is, is simply going to be the Josephson junction uh, uh, that is sitting uh, at, at the center of this uh, of this uh, qubit, okay? So like, now, now let's uh, see what four wave we can pick. Okay, so one wave is going to be a pump tone, right? A pump tone is so it's a, a tone we, we just like provide to the to the nonlinearity, and the second wave is going to be the incoming photon, okay? And so now I'm allowed to mix these two incoming waves, right? And to mix them. Uh, with like two outcoming waves, okay? And so the two outcoming waves, one wave will be uh, one qubit excitation, okay? And the other wave will be like a, a, a dissipate a photon that is going to be dissipated, okay? So you see like total, uh, I have like four waves. So I, I displayed the Hamiltonian. So Xi is a pump wave. A was the incoming photon wave. Sigma dagger 
is uh, uh, the qubit excitation and B dagger is an uh, emitted photon in, in, the other, uh, in the other mode, okay? And for this four wave mixing uh, uh, to work, we need to, to adjust the pump frequency such so that uh, the, the process, okay? So you like uh, the energy of the qubit excitation and the dissipated photon equals the energy of the incoming photon and the pump, right? So this is the way we pick the pump frequency, okay? And what is interesting, you see, you see like two incoming waves, two outgoing waves, something extremely interesting is that like now once the, the, the outcoming wave, like the green photon uh, is dissipated, right? Uh, our, our, our qubit is absolutely, is not allowed to, uh, to, re to relax anymore. The re re reverse process is not allowed anymore because it will need like the, the other waves, so the green, the green photon in order to, uh, to, uh, to perform the, the opposite, um, uh, the reverse to mechanism, okay? So in a way, by dissipating this extra photon, this green photon uh, into the environment, we make uh, th this process absolutely irreversible, okay? And so if we perform like a, what is called like an adiabatic elimination, so if we, if we just discard uh, the behavior of, uh, of the, this extra dumping mode, we, 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 we get exactly this uh, jump operator A sigma dagger, okay? But in a way, like uh, another way I like to, to describe it is like uh, here it's like the a particle conservation uh, 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 problem, right? So you have like two particles uh, uh, at, um, at the beginning. You create two particles, but one escape very quickly. So that like uh, if you want to have the reverse process, uh, you, you would need like uh, uh, this extra particle back in order to, to allow the, this process to work. All right. Um, so, okay, so let's now describe it like, uh, uh, um, just let's come back to, to the, to, to the uh, beginning. So we have like uh, one coming photon, one pump photon, okay. So now we, this, uh, um, this, the four wave mixing converts this into one qubit excitation and one photon in the green mode. Okay, the green mode is also connected to the, to the environment. This green photon quickly escapes. And therefore, the qubit is, uh, is left excited uh, in, its, uh, in its cavity, and, uh, and we are not um, and is not able to relax. And we have plenty of time uh, to, to, to measure its state, right? So, so that's the really the key key principle of this uh, of this detector. So something which which is quite interesting is that, like at some point of the detection process, you, you want you would like to uh, to make uh, to to make the qubit go back uh, qu uh, quickly in, in its uh, ground state. And one way to do it, right, if you, if you understood well, uh, if, you, if you provide now uh, the photon that has been dissipated uh, uh, earlier, right, then this uh, pho green photon can combine, or this green photon can combine with the qubit excitation and, 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 uh, and perform the, the reverse process, okay? So because now I have like these two, uh, two particles, uh, uh, so the qubit excitation and, and the uh, photon excitation, I'm allowed to to uh, to expand the reverse process. Okay, so and this is going to be the way uh, to perform like a, the, the reset of the detector. Okay, and which is very important in the task of uh, photon detection. Okay, so that's uh, that's our circuit. So our circuit is a, a, a two-dimensional um, coplanar waveguide uh, resonator. So that's the layout. Uh, so. Um, so the gray uh, areas are like a, a superconducting ground plane. So it's made of uh, aluminum, typically. Uh, the lines, so uh, here I have like an orange line. So uh, you can understand this coplanar waveguide as like a, just a, a, a waveguide, the transmission lines. Okay, and if I interrupt at each end um, uh, this waveguide, I have like um, uh, cavities, right? So resonator. So this is uh, like the analog of like this LC oscillator I was talking at the beginning, or this like three D, uh, three uh, you know, uh, you know, like this cavity defined by mirrors. Okay. So I have the orange one, which is an input uh, resonator. I have the green one, uh, which is used for the dissipation of this uh, extra photon in the four in the four wave mixing process. I have the qubit uh, in blue, and uh, an extra line which is used to pump uh, to, to pump the, the qubit. Something I will talk about uh, later is like I have this uh, squid line, which allow me to uh, tune uh, the frequency of this input resonator to make this, uh, uh, this uh, photon detector uh, usable in practice. Okay. And so you see like typically the frequencies were like uh, uh, in play 
are like uh, uh, 7 gigahertz for the input resonator, 7.6 for the output resonator, and 6.1 for the qubit. But like once again, this is artificial, uh, artificial atoms and uh, artificial circuits. So uh, in a sense, uh, this, uh, this frequencies can be choose everywhere between 4 and 10 gigahertz, right? Then you just need to make the coupling uh, uh, work well to, to, to make sure this process is efficient enough. Um, so yeah, let's keep in mind that actually this is a chip, uh, chip but this, uh, this is a, actually a full circuit QD uh, experiment. And so for, for this to work uh, well, we also need like, for instance, a Josephson parametric amplifier in order to uh, efficiently uh, read out the state of our qubit, right? And we, we need like uh, many lines uh, uh, in the fridge in order to, uh, to, to perform this experiment uh, correctly. So I believe, uh, I believe this could be like simplified a bit, but uh, not, not much, right? So that's, uh, that's uh, an idea of like the circuit, uh, circuit layout for, for, to make this, uh, this experiment work. Um, so, okay, so let's start with like experimental, uh, experimental results. So, um, uh, so we are going to characterize the efficiency of this process. So what we are going to do is to uh, uh, provide a pump tone for like a, a, time, a detection time uh, a top, uh, T, right? So that's the, or, uh, the purple wave. And in the, in the same time, we are going to provide like a, a, an input photon, so some, some, uh, some small uh, co coherent field, okay? And, and after this process, the orange uh, box uh, is, uh, corresponds to the readout of the qubit um, um, uh, using another probe tone, okay? And so um, this is what we are measuring. So here I'm plotting the pump frequency as a function of the pump uh, amplitude, okay? In two, with two distinct scenarios, one when I'm providing energy uh, uh, at the input of the resonator and one without providing energy. And what you see, so, and what I'm plot, the color plot is uh, the, the uh, uh, probability of uh, the qubit getting excited, okay? And what you see is that like, if you are providing like incoming photon, then you have like some, uh, for some uh, frequencies and some amplitude, uh, you have like the, the qubit getting excited. However, if, if no photon are, are incoming, like the, the, the background stay absolutely zero. Okay, so this is a confirmation that this forward mixing process is actually working. Okay, we are able to excite our qubit in a, in a irreversible manner. Okay, and so the fact that the, the, uh, the matching condition for the pump uh, is changing as function of the, of, the ampli of the amplitude is due to the AC star shift. So the, when, when we are like providing energy to the qubit, the, its, it's frequency is changing a little bit and the matching condition is also a, a changing a bit. But it, it's a rather technical uh, detail. And so now we can, uh, we can um, uh, uh, measure the efficiency of this detector. So the way we do that, we, we are like, uh, independently calibrating the photon flux we are sending to our uh, resonator. And so basically by, uh, so here I'm, I'm plotting, so the excitation of the qubit as function of the uh, co coherent amplitude uh, epsilon squared. And, and this is like uh, the calibrated one. So it's an absolute, uh, it's an absolute number. And the slope, uh, uh, this, the slope between these two, uh, these two quantities uh, uh, gives directly the efficiency, right? So basically if I provide 0 point photon Op uh, 0.2 photon uh, at the input. Uh, if I had like perfect efficiency, I would expect like you know, point, uh, point 0.2 uh, qubit excitation um, uh, on average, right? And basically, this is we observe something close to that. And so, like by by, uh, by um, measuring like the discrepancy uh, between between these numbers, we are able to, uh, to to characterize our efficiency. And so here we show like a, an intrinsic efficiency of around 70 percent for like the uh, uh, detection process. So which is uh, which is actually quite uh, uh, qu quite good. What's the counting rate, Emmanuel? Um, so so yeah so so um, the counting rate is defined uh, in a um, uh, uh, you know so so this is exactly what I'm I'm going to present right now. Okay. So you see like this uh, the counting rate is, is a bit hard to define because um, this detector is actually a, a sequential detector. Okay. Because you see like uh, the way we are revealing the, 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 the incoming photon is by performing a readout of the qubit and this readout of the qubit and needs to be performed uh, uh, when, when the detector is not working, okay? And so like what we, we perform is the cycli cyclic operation. So, for, so this can, like this number are like a bit arbitrary, but that's typically what, what we do. 
So for the five first microseconds, we, we pump uh, the circuit. And so this is performing like the actual uh, uh, detection. Okay, and so for instance, if we want to, to do some calibration, we, we also like input some, uh, some probe, uh, probe, uh, probe tone in order to provide like some uh, photon flux. After, after this detection window, uh, we stop the detection process and we uh, pump uh, and, and we, uh, we, uh, we probe the state of the qubit. And the, uh, probing the state of the qubit is typically like a two microseconds. Okay, and, and once the qubit state uh, is probed, uh, we reset uh, the qubit and we are resetting it um, as the way I described. So we just reactivate the detection process and now rather of putting energy on the, on, the on the input of the detector, we put energy on the dissipation port uh, of the detector and this uh, performs like an efficient reset of the qubit. And so what you see is that like, uh, so what we'll get is like every 10 microseconds, right, we'll get like one bit, okay? So the counting rate, uh, so I, I believe this is a, that the, that the answer of, uh, to your question is like, we get at most one bit per uh, 10 microseconds. Okay. And so here you see that the duty cycle is going to reduce um, uh, slightly the efficiency. And so here, if we pick like a duty cycle of 50%, right? The, the effective efficiency uh, rather than being 70% is going to be 35%. But, but once again, this duty cycle, uh, you know, like this uh, detection cycle can be uh, uh, chosen. Uh, um, I mean, you could extend the detection window in order to, uh, to make this duty cycle uh, slightly, um, uh, slightly uh, higher. So yeah, but th that's, uh, that's, exactly, that's the way we, we, we operate this detector. So it's a, it's a cyclic detector. Okay, so now let's, um, uh, let's perform some measurements. Um, so what we are, so what we, we are going to repeat uh, this cycle of 10 microseconds, so over like, over like 25 milliseconds. And so like on 25 milliseconds, you see uh, uh, you can, uh, uh, so uh, if I'm right, so it's a uh, 2,500 uh, uh, sequences, right, so cycles we are providing. So we have like uh, 2,500 slots where we have like, in each slot we have like, um, uh, we have like a bit, and this bit corresponds to the state of the qubit. Okay, and so now what, what I'm displaying here is like the clicks, like uh, I'm just displaying when the, 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 we, we, we measure the qubit in, in its excited state. And so here, uh, the first, um, uh, this first uh, data set uh, is um, uh, the, the state of the detector uh, without incoming photons. So this is what we call a, a dark count, right? So if you don't provide energy, how often like this uh, detector clicks? And what you see that like over 25 uh, milliseconds, we, we get like a few clicks. And this, uh, uh, we can detect, we can, um, um, uh, we can actually, so like we can characterize this, uh, um, this uh, dark count rates uh, with the rates. So, and, and in, on average, we get like 0.5 counts per millisecond. Okay, so that's a dark count rate of around like 500 hertz. All right. Now we are, re we are going to repeat this experiment. No, but like providing like a few, uh, a little bit of uh, photon flux. So we provide on average, uh, two photons per millisecond. So it's about like a, a, a 10 to the minus 20 watts, right, in, in terms of energy. And what we, we see is like, like an increase of the click of, of, the, of the photon detector. And you can check that this, um, so since we are providing like a, a current state like this, uh, we can measure like the, um, uh, you know, we, we, can, we can check that this is a corresponding to a Poisson and distribution. Okay, so we, we just like observe like randomly some clicks. Okay, uh, now we can increase uh, the flux. So if we put like 20 photons per millisecond, right, we, we see like, a, um, uh, like um, an increase of the click rate. And each time we are retaking a dark count just to, to check like everything is, is, is good um, uh, uh, otherwise, right? And then you can increase so 200 photons. And finally, if we put like 2000 photons, basically the, the detector clicks um, uh, uh, almost every time. Okay. So that's typically uh, uh, how this uh, detector is operated. So it's a cyclic uh, detector, and we just observe clicks um, every 10, uh, 10, 10 uh, microseconds. And, and these clicks are like, you know, like correspond to, um, you know, it's um, the faithful uh, detection of the, um, of the incoming, uh, inc incoming energy. All right. So Emmanuel, so our yeah. typical power is, is a, a signal power is about 10 to the minus 23 watts. 
which corresponds yes. to a few photons per second. Yes, yes. So your, your, your photon detector should work. Yes. Uh, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm going to talk about this uh, at the end. So here, like, you see, like, the efficiency is fairly good, right? Even if we have, like, um, okay, so we have 70% or 60%, like, uh, as an intrinsic efficiency. Uh, it's reduced by 50% due to the duty cycle. So, like, the effective detector efficiency is, like, more 30%. But, but like, the, the, here, the key, uh, key figure of merit is actually the dark count, right? So uh, if you want to detect, like, uh, uh, one photon per second, basically, it's better to have like one dark count per second on average, right? It could be more than that, but uh, typically, um, typically that. And so, uh, what the, the quantity you want to work on is uh, this dark count rate. So basically, you would like to bring this dark count to like a kilohertz range to um, uh, like to 10, uh, 10 hertz range, something like that. And I guess uh, in, at the end of the talk, uh, uh, how we can uh, we can envision to do that. All right. Oh. Just, Emmanuel, just repeat your last statement. You faded away a little bit. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so my last statement is just saying that, like, the, the dark count um, can be, I believe the dark count can be improved uh, by uh, at least a factor 10. Yeah, so, yeah. so, you know, like, that, that's, uh, you know, like, you know, I, I, you know, I, I cannot prove it, but, uh, you know, like, I, I, you know, there are, there are like pretty straightforward way, you know, by improving the fabrication and everything. Basically, you see like it's exactly the same as like trying to improve like the efficiency of, um, of a, a JPA, right? So basically that's the first version of the circuit, but like by working a little harder, right? We can probably improve, uh, in, improve this, uh, this dark count rate by, by so testing by, uh, by 50 years. Our power eventually will be a lot higher than that. So this would work. It's it's uh, th these are good numbers yeah so so like something uh, maybe i should mention uh, now right so what what are why do we have like dark counts right and so and so the answer is actually quite simple it it, it just because like our qubit actually um, you know qubits are known the artificial qubits supercomputing qubits are known to be like a little bit uh, uh, out of equilibrium so meaning that even if the dilution fridge temperature is at 10 millikelvin, right? So we we, sh we should expect like some um, some some occupation of uh, order like 10 minus 10 or something or 10 minus 11, right? But 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 what happened is like uh, uh, due to uh, various um, so this is what we call a quasi particle, and so actually it has been shown recently that it may be due to some uh, spurious radioactivity uh, in the fridge and stuff like that. So like what we observe like in general we observe like a equilibrium equilibrium population around one percent. Okay, and so now you can also like try to improve a little bit by you know if you reset the, your qubit at the very beginning of the experiment, you can reset it like to ten minus three or ten minus four level, but it will quickly rise to the the uh, some equilibrium, and this rise due to ju just this out of equilibrium like this effective temperature which is much higher than the fridge temperature gives rise to this dark count. Okay, so one way to um, uh, one way to improve this dark count dramatically, so is so we have uh, a, a few ways. So either you can try to make your qubit um, uh, operate at higher frequency. So like this, uh, even if the effective temperature of the environment is higher, uh, you know, like uh, the thermal excitation will will, uh, um, will be lower. So that's one way. And the other way is also by improving the the, um, the relaxation relaxation rate of your qubit. So like right now we have like T1s of 10 microseconds. So which is like comparable with the detection window. So that actually this is the way we pick the detection window. Detection window corresponds to the half of the relaxation rate of the, of the qubit. Because basically when the qubit is up, you know, you, you, want, you, you want to be able to, to detect its state before it relaxes, right? And so, but 10 microseconds is far from the, the state of the art. So like the state of the art right now is like 300 microseconds. So it's a factor 30 above, right? And so this has a consequence for the, um, uh, for the thermalization of this, uh, of this qubit because uh, this relaxation rate is also the thermalization rate, okay? So if I have like a, if I can uh, initialize my qubit at 10, 10 minus four or 10 minus five, right? It will uh, re uh, relax back in his uh, thermal equilibrium in T1. So in so if T1 now is 300 microseconds, it means that like the rate 
of excitation due to the environment is lowered by, by a lot. Right, so by, by improving this T1, uh, this relaxation rate, I, I, I will be able to, you know, if I get a, a factor 10 on the relaxation rate, I get directly a factor 10 on the dark count. It's as simple as that. Okay, so, so just moving to state-of-the-art qubits um, uh, will do the job, I believe. All right, yeah. is it clear for everyone? Great, thank you. Okay, so, so that's like, a, a, you know, a, a, this is what I've, I was planning to, 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 to tell you uh, at the end, but um, okay. Um, yeah, something like very important. So um, we can tune uh, this detector. So yeah, so like the bandwidth of the detector is given by the bandwidth of the input cavity. And for this detection, this detection process uh, to work, we need like band a fairly low bandwidth because this like for a mixing process is actually quite, uh, quite weak. So we need like the bandwidth to be to match the efficiency of the process. I mean, like the, the, the coupling of, of this forward mixing coupling. Okay, and so this is why we have like one megahertz bandwidth, typically. But actually, this is fairly good. Uh, you, for most of the, of the signal, we, we try to probe it. all the signal are on this uh, similar bandwidth, like one megahertz, typically. But what we can do is to tune uh, this, uh, this uh, resonance frequency over like a, a, a wide range, so 200 megahertz, typically, but it could be probably more. Right, and so what we have proved, so by, by placing a squid uh, at the center of the resonator, so a squid is, a, is, um, is two Josephson junction in parallel. So it's very similar to what you have like in parametric amplifiers, for instance, Josephson parametric amplifiers. So now we can just place a squid and, and, and tune uh, and, and bias the squid in order to tune the resonator frequency. And so here is this, uh, the experimental uh, result. So we can tune the resonator between 7.1 and uh, 6.9. Right, and have like a, still like um, uh, a good efficiencies uh, uh, along this curve. So performances are, are a little bit degraded uh, uh, lower on the curve because we're we experiencing like some jittering noise and stuff like that. But but you see like it, it's still uh, decently good. Uh, so that's something you need to keep in mind. Uh, so like now uh, I'll go very quickly on this, but it just to emphasize that this detector is, is, is working like very differently from like a, a usual photo detector because it's actually like a quantum non-demolition detector in a sense, right? So, and the reason why is like when the, uh, the incoming photon is absorbed uh, in, in this cavity and converted uh, into the environment, right? And into a qubit excitation, actually the, excite, the, the quantum information is not lost. Right? The quantum information is actually transferred in this uh, green photon, okay? And so now what, what, we've, what we've done is like to measure, uh, uh, to perform a tomography of this uh, uh, green photon, uh, condition on a click or an absence of a click of the detector. And so this is what I plot here. So I'll go very quickly on this because it's a bit technical. But what we see is that like, if the detector doesn't click, then the green green photon is likely to be uh, to is likely to be the, the vacuum state, right? With like a, a, a good um, uh, with a good fidelity. However, now if the detector is clicking, the state we are measuring at the output at, in the dissipation arm of the detector is actually very close to a uh, to a Fox state. Okay, so uh, uh, and so you see like what what we see is that like we kind of projected the incoming photon on, on, on this photon, and actually all the waveform information are, are, are preserved. And so, and so just to, to emphasize that, like, you know, it's not, a, you know, it's, a, it's really, um, uh, this task is really like some quantum information, uh, quantum information processing uh, task, right? So we, we are like uh, routing information rather than uh, like just uh, destroying it, like using like this photo, photo ionization processes, okay? So it just like, it's uh, some physics detail, but uh, I quite like it. Um, so yeah, so now let me move to, uh, to the second part of the talk. I'll, I'll try to be uh, quick. Um, so the experiment we are performing now is trying to um, couple a, a single spin impurity uh, to, um, uh, to a resonator. So it's a superconducting resonator and try to measure, uh, to try to, to be able to, to, to probe this uh, single spin impurities uh, with a microwave, photon, a microwave detector. Okay, so these impurities, um, so we are like working with three types of impurities. So either like a, some bismuth donor in silicon, 
but it can be also NV centers uh, in diamond or erbium in, uh, in some um, uh, uh, weird oxide uh, crystal. Okay. And each of these impurities actually uh, uh, behaving like, it, you know, it has like a basically a free electrons that is basically trapped in this uh, crystal, uh, crystal matrix. And so these impurities like just behave like as like small atoms, small emitters. Okay. And so what, so here, what, what we are, we are using like bismuth in silicon. And so what we do is like we have these chips of silicon that are like implanted with some bismuth donor. And what we do is we print a, a, a superconducting resonator on top of this chip. And we have like this tiny, tiny inductor that is uh, uh, linking this uh, big superconducting pads. Okay. And what we have like is like uh, these impurities are sitting like below uh, this, uh, these tiny inductors. And so why, why do we have like a, 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 this such a tiny inductor? It's because like uh, we have like, we force like a lot of currents passing uh, through this wire and therefore the magnetic field, um, uh, the oscillating magnetic field D1 is actually like a, a, um, a greatly enhanced uh, thanks to this uh, constriction. Okay. And so what we have proved in the past, so in, in, in the group uh, um, I, I'm now, uh, so is that like we can show that like this uh, impurities can radiatively decay uh, uh, in this resonator. So now the emission of the photon uh, in, the, in, the in, in this resonator is a dominant uh, relaxation mechanism. Okay. So basically this, uh, this uh, impurities are, real, are going to relax by the emission of a single photon. And the great thing about these uh, impurities is that like uh, they, they have also like a, a great uh, current time. So uh, we have shown like uh, recently that like uh, these impurities can exhibit like a second time scale uh, uh, current time, right? So this, this can, this impurity can be like a very good um, a tool for like quantum information processing. So up to now, uh, the way these impurities were detected is by using like quantum limited amplifiers. So, and, and, and actually, so we managed to, in, in some very precise settings to achieve like sensitivity of 10 spins by measuring for uh, uh, one second. Okay. And I, I will show you uh, how we have been able to enhance uh, this sensitivity by a lot by replacing this quantum limited amplifier uh, by the so-called uh, single microwave photon detector I've just presented. Okay. And so here you see like the, the, the goal is to perform like single shot detection of uh, uh, each of these impurities. So if one impurity relax, it will emit one photon. And if the detector is good enough, right? So we get a click. And, and uh, so, so that, that's the goal of the task. So we are not there yet, but uh, I will present like a, a, re, a recent results, a result we, we took like last month uh, um, uh, that are like, um, that are uh, toward this uh, single, uh, single spin detection. So that's a, a picture of our deletion fridge. So sorry, it's a bit of a mess, but so what is nice with this, det this detector is that like it can sit like wherever you want and it can be like very distant uh, from, um, uh, from, the, um, uh, from the spins. Okay, and so why is it important? It's because we need to apply ma a large mag magnetic field. I mean, when I say large, it's like a few tens of millitesla uh, in order to, um, uh, to tune uh, the spin frequency. And so it's better to do that like away from the detector. Okay, and so what now? What we are going to do now, so that the pulse sequence um, uh, we are applying. So we apply a, a pi pulse on the spins. So we excite the spins, and now we uh, we we apply these uh, detection sequences. And typically, we apply like forty thousand uh, uh, detection uh, cycles. Okay, and so we expect to see like this uh, this uh, diagrams. So um, here uh, on the left, on the right, I'm plotting like um, uh, like what we expect. So when you do a pi pulse, you don't expect any uh, coherence in the ensemble left. However, you expect like a, a, a decay of the polarization of the spin ensemble due to the spontaneous relaxation. Okay, and so even if on average you don't the field amplitude, you know, since this uh, decurrence is not uh, locked to any phase, the field amplitude is going to be uh, to vanish very quickly to zero. However, the photon flux. Uh, we, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, will stay uh, non-zero, okay? So, and so this is where, uh, like it's in very interesting to use a photon detector to detect like this uh, extra photon flux. Okay, and so this is uh, the um, detection record uh, 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 we get. So like here I'm representing each time the, uh, the photon detector clicks. 
And what you can see is that like at the beginning, uh, you get like more clicks and, uh, and, and, uh, and the number of, of clicks is, are reducing uh, as a function of time. Okay. And so now we can repeat this experience uh, over and over and perform histograms. And so this is what we get uh, typically. So here, like we were like at a, a bias point of the detector where like the dark count rate was around 1.5 uh, counts per millisecond. And what we see is like a clear excess of the count rate uh, at early time uh, in the sequence. And, and, you, and, and what is nice is that like, as the time goes on, like the uh, uh, photon flux is reducing. And by measuring the decay uh, of this photon flux, uh, we can directly measure the, the relaxation time of uh, our spin ensemble. Okay. Uh, now we can also like try to uh, characterize the sensitivity uh, of, this, uh, of this detector. And so we, we are just plotting like histograms uh, of like uh, of the uh, um, uh, Count, count uh, uh, when uh, we don't apply the pipers and when we apply the pipers. And we see a clear uh, non-overlapping Gaussians sh showing that we, we are able to, uh, to distinguish like uh, um, uh, in a single shot the absence or not of, of, this, uh, of these pipers, okay? And what is nice is like, uh, so in this ensemble, we are exciting on average a thousand spins. So the total efficiency is around 10%. It's because we have like some uh, insertion losses uh, between uh, the spin ensemble and the detector, and in particular, like the, the, the cavity of the spin ensemble is um, uh, uh, exhibits some uh, internal losses that that uh, and, and uh, like a, a large fraction of the signal is, is going away, but we still have ten percent. And the dark is like around five kilohertz. And with these numbers, we, we can we are able to show um, that our detection of uh, of the spin ensemble is is actually beyond the standard quantum limit. And that the standard quantum limit without, without taking into account like uh, uh, imperfection. So, and so this is, you know, we, we can clearly show that we, we perform better uh, than if we were trying to perform this task with like a parametric amplifier. Okay, and that's the first step. Uh, um, uh, so now we can, uh, uh, we can uh, characterize our spin ensemble. So T1 is simply the decay of this photon flux. We, so we measure like 300 milliseconds. We can perform radio oscillation of the spin ensemble by varying uh, the, um, the, um, uh, the energy we sent to the spin ensemble. And we can also measure the, the current time. So here at this particular bias point, we get 1.5 millisecond current time. Okay. And so I think that's, um, yeah, that's about it for, so uh, I, I'm done uh, uh, for this talk. And so let me conclude. So I, I'm going to repeat what I said uh, earlier. So what are the perspectives for, for uh, improving this photon detector? Um, and actually, so uh, as I mentioned, so like our, the relaxation time of the qubit in the photon detector is right now 10 microseconds. So, and it's actually like on the really lower end of the, of, of the, of the qubit that we are able to fab uh, nowadays. So a typical uh, state-of-the-art qubit is going to be 100 microseconds. And uh, like the best uh, qubits can be up to 300 microseconds, and this can be uh, this will will improve certainly in, in the in, in the coming years. Okay, and as I mentioned, so this relaxation time uh, gives you basically the equilibration time uh, with the environment. And so if you are uh, uh, able to reset your qubit very precisely, which is uh, which is what we're able to do, uh, this means that like the dark count rate um, by improving the T1 is going to be uh, to be um, lower by a factor 10. Okay. Uh, so uh, another perspective on, on the qubit control. So now we are like able to perform a real time feedback on the, on the qubit state. So meaning that we, we don't need to uh, reset uh, the qubit at each cycle, but only reset the qubit when the qubit uh, is actually excited, right? If we measure the qubit in its ground state, you, need, you don't need to reset it. And so this improves a lot the duty cycle uh, time. And so we can go uh, from a 50% to 90% detection cycle. So, and this will improve like the overall efficiency of the, of the process. Okay. Uh, and, and something uh, like that's an experiment that is ongoing. So by moving to a higher frequency transition for the qubit state, right? So it means that like the, the, the qubit will be like colder. So I mean like the, the environment it, it, it will feel will be uh, colder. And, and, um, and this means that like um, the dark count rate will also be uh, smaller. And so like right now we are measuring like dark count rate like below uh, 100 Hertz. Uh, however, like the detection efficiency is still a bit disappointing, but it's a very preliminary result. So, uh, so, um, so, you know, 
And, and what I believe, you know, what is achievable within two, three years, um, so, okay, maybe it's a bit ambitious, but uh, okay, that, that's my hope, that we can probably uh, get, so if we combine like uh, long T1 and high, high frequency, we can pro probably uh, um, achieve like a dark count rate around 10 Hertz and detection efficiency uh, as, as high as like um, 80%, or at least above 50%, right? Um, so on the single, on, on the spin ensemble uh, uh, side, if we improve the, the coupling of the spin ensemble uh, to, uh, to the microwave resonator, so right now the coupling is 200 Hertz, and we can easily uh, improve it to two, two kilohertz. So like with like such a low dark concentrate and uh, high coupling, uh, we, we will be uh, in good position to, to perform single shot detection of uh, single spins. All right, I thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for this pretty nice talk. So, so we have uh, questions. Okay. Can this detector detect multiple tones in one spot? So I, 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 sorry, I, cannot, I cannot hear the question, so I'm, I'm sorry. So why should you know you, 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 your system see multiple photons at a time? Yes, yes. So, so, um, so it's actually a, a, a photon detector. So what we, are not dete what we are detecting is not really like the, um, uh, the presence of a photon. Uh, is actually like what we are detecting is, a, is the absence of being in the ground state. So the detection of our, our observable is actually like O or not zero. You see, vacuum or not vacuum. So if you have like several photons, you will just uh, see uh, not vacuum. So okay. it's not a, it's, it's not an energy result detector. We could, we could try to, 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 you know, to find a, 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 a process to, in order to map like one photon to uh, the first excitation of uh, the first excited state of the qubit and two photons to the second excited state, let's say, but this is, uh, you know, this is not clear to me how to do that. And so like, we, we're like focused on, uh, you know, like basically low stream of photons. So what we are detecting is vacuum or not vacuum. So your dead time, as I understood, is 10 microseconds. That's it, right? Five microseconds. Uh, yeah, dead time is five, is five microseconds, basically. Five. So basically, you know, when, when, you, when we get like the real time feedback, uh, basically, um, yeah, like to reset the qubit. So we need to re read out the qubit and to reset it. And this whole process is like five microseconds. Right. Okay. Other questions? So what would be your perspective on qubit control? So you real time feedback you decide so you said that you, you can improve uh, up to 90%, right? Yeah, the cycle. So yeah, what we can also try to do, so this is also something we would like to do is to, so you could imagine to read out the qubit while the detector is working. Okay. okay. But the drawback is that like, um, so you see like when you read out a qubit, what, what you do is like you, you decrease the, the co coherence rate of the qubit, right? By, because measurement is, is, is providing like in a sense like a decoherence. And, uh, and the problem is that like the four wave mixing process is going to be a little bit affected. Uh, by this extra decoherence felt uh, by the qubit. And so, um, but, but, you know, we have like plans to try, so we could try to perform like continuous readout of the qubit on the side while it's detecting, but this continuous readout, we need to be extremely uh, gentle, right? And not to disturb the, the, the detection process. And so, um, yeah, we could imagine like to be, to have like a continuous, uh, some, some sort of continuous trace with like some, where you can, you know, like very precisely uh, have like the arrival time of the photon and everything. That's something we could imagine to do. But like right now, like the real-time feedback is the easy, easiest, easiest stuff to, we can we can do. It's just buying an expensive uh, FPJ board. Yes. Uh, so what about you know? Is there any you know nice way to increase the frequency tunability? Yeah, so increase the frequency tunability. So, so I believe it's possible. Um, the, only pro the only drawback is that like, um, 
Uh, in like you have like a magnetic field noise uh, in the circuit, and so and, and you see like the bandwidth uh, the bandwidth of the input resonator is, is fairly small, and so if the magnetic noise is basically is making the the, the, the uh, input resonator jittering, you, you don't want like this magnetic noise to overwhelm uh, to overwhelm the um, uh, uh, like this, this input resonator, right? If the jittering is larger uh, than the line width um, uh, of the input resonator, basically uh, uh, you know this will lower the efficiency by a lot. So uh, you have two ways to do that. So you can try to, so right now we are using a single squid. So we could uh, use like a squid array uh, that would be possible. And you, you would maybe hope to have like some compensation mechanism and lower like the effective, um, effective jittering or like try to, to work a lot on materials in order to, to, to reduce this uh, jittering uh, rate. I mean like we are like far from the state of the art in terms of ma magnetic noise. So that could be, uh, could be an option. But also something something else I should mention that like you see like this um, four wave mixing to work. Um, you see like we you need to carefully engineer like the exact coupling and exact detuning between the qubit, the input resonator, the output resonator, right? And so if you have like a too like if the tuning range is too large, right? Basically uh, you 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 know. Um, uh, this careful, uh, careful engineering, it will be like, you know, it's, it's really hard to, to carefully engineer these this processes like for, a, for, a, for like a tuning range of like over one gigahertz, let's say, right? You, you need this, uh, this change in frequency to be fairly small compared to the, uh, to, to the typical parameters we're using. In, in, uh, and also in terms of detuning, right? So like typical detuning are like for us, it's one gigahertz. So, if we tune it, if, we, if you tune the, the components by uh, 200 megahertz, then it's, it's uh, small enough. But if we tune it by one gigahertz, uh, you know, it, it will be in trouble. So, so something like for improving the tuning, something we can envision to, first of all, we can have like multiple detectors. So detectors can be like engineer wherever you want. Uh, something else, we, can, we could have like a frequency converter. So you could have like a very efficient frequency converter based on Josephson junction and uh, everything. So I have like a fixed frequency detector and just like a, a sweeping uh, the, conver the con frequency conversion and like this, uh, you, you know, like, and this uh, frequency conversion process is actually way more, uh, uh, you know, doesn't rely on like very careful tuning of, of couplings. So, so that could be an option. Good, okay. Uh, some other questions, comments. So last one, so you said that in two to three years, in my milestone, this count rate down to 10 volts and the test efficiency 8%. That is your promise, right? I mean, this is what I, I, I'll, I'll try to, to sell to the, uh, to the um, you know, to funding agency at, at least. <laughs> but no, I, I, no, no, I, I believe, no, honestly, I believe, um, you know, maybe turn out, you know, okay, that's the very, that's the optimi optimistic side, okay. I, I do believe that 100 hertz is like a really uh, achievable goal. So 100 hertz is, um, 100 hertz and 70% efficiency is like something, um, you know, it's just a matter of like, um, you know, yeah. engineering. Right. Like it, it, at this point, it's, you see, it's like material engineering, like so, so it just depends on how, how good is your fab, um, how good is your, uh, you know, fab, you know. So it, it's really like material engineering. So there, there is nothing in the process that is limiting like uh, ultimately this, this dark country. Okay, okay. All right, so let's take the speaker again.